so I'm going to introduce our next panel, which will go over how election processes maintain integrity. Um, we're going to start the panel with Monica Evans, who is the newly named Executive Director in the District of Columbia. We also have Dwayne Jones from Facilities Management Coordinator from the District of Columbia, Shelly Jackson, the Deputy Director of Elections in Utah, and Neil Kelly, the Registrar of Voters in Orange County, California. And I think we'll start with Monica. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Amy. Good to be here. Um, I'm just going to kick it off before I hand off to my esteemed colleague. Um, essentially, DC Board of Elections is an independent agency, and of course, we are charged to enfr enfranchise eligible residents, conduct elections, and ensure the integrity of the electoral process. And of course, DC is uniquely situated in that we essentially operate as a state and a local entity. We don't just promote fair elections and equitable elections. We also administer elections and everything that comes with that mission. And this includes registering voters, qualifying candidates and certifying ballot measures, establishing polling places and precinct boundaries, conducting voter education and outreach, recruiting and training poll workers, conducting elections, and of course, certifying results. Election security has always been an important focus as we prepare for an election cycle. And as you all know, the 2020 election cycle highlighted election security in a major way. And we have safeguards in place that affect all of our systems, and that includes measures that take place before, during, and after an election. In particular, we are going to focus on logic and accuracy testing of our voting equipment. Logic and accuracy testing is performed prior to each election and is designed to ensure our voting equipment is performing properly and accurately. To describe our process in detail, I'm joined by Dwan Jones. He's the facility management and support specialist at DCBOE. He's our subject matter expert and oversees our logic and accuracy or LNA testing process. And I'm going to kick it over to Dwan. Good, good afternoon. My name is Dwan Jones. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to present to you today. Today I'm going over our logic accuracy testing process with our express vote on the DC VS 200. Today I will be providing you an overview of the following agenda. Providing an overview of the logic accuracy testing process, reviewing the observer protocol, reviewing the test guidelines and regulations, discussing the equipment requirements, discussing the scripts testing and express vote in GS200. Highlighting safety, security of the equipment, results and documentation, and finally summarizing the logic accuracy test. Uh, at a high level, this page provides an overview of the logic accuracy test. The DC Board of Elections, also known as GCBOE, we conduct the, the logic accuracy testing, also known as the LMA process was designed to verify the ballot programming, prepare voting equipment, to certify the voting equipment and properly read and tabulate votes for the each election. Setting up the setting up requires us to use the DS200 scanner, the express votes, and the respective USB memory stick for each uh, election definition. The next slide, this next slide here is our protocols for the next slide is here for our protocols for uh, uh, for our, uh, LNA process because we're it's open to members of the public for anyone to come out and look at us do our testing of our voting system. Here are some of our protocols. Just just to name a few, our observers must roster, sign a roster to enter our warehouse. We must remain in the designated area of the warehouse to observe the LNA process. If they have any questions, they must uh, ask any questions to the, the supervisor that's on duty at the time. They may not uh, touch any voting material, equipment, anything in that manner, uh, obstruct in the LNA process at any time, talk to, question, or interview any of the uh, testing LNA presenters, technicians, I'm sorry, uh, use any video still cameras inside the LNA uh, process. As you can see, the slide shows a test of regulations and guidelines. Um, here's a few guidelines uh, I'll let you go over. Um, complete testing 
of the automatic type deletion system. Verification of conditions verified, I mean, requiring the voting equipment and testing the recording test vote, uh, votes from a predetermined script that includes valid votes, overvotes, blank votes, and also confirming each candidate and valid question can be collected on, on all voting equipment. This is just a continuation of, uh, of the decimal regulations that we had. Right. Now, now we're going to get to, to the, the key part of the uh, LNA, which is testing the equipment. Testing the, testing the, uh, the equipment is performed with approximately 20 testers, in which they may take up to 10 to 15 minutes per express vote. Each. Depending on depending on the ballot or the rate. Also, we have DS two hundred that we're testing, and it could take a little longer because we we're depending on the amount of ballots. And so, if you have early voting, you say early voting uh, site, it may if you're testing early voting sites, it may have hundreds of ballots that are being tested. So it's going to take a lot longer to test. These techni these technicians this which has a single ballot, I mean, single polling location. Most locations I, I actually, these, these locations uh, provided, I send the technician to, to each polling location. And so the technician will test that actual location throughout the, the election process from the LNA process and then also the technician throughout the early voting and for election day. Uh, these, the, these express vote ballots that, that will be tested will also be used as for the DS-200, DS-200 voting unit. Those will also be tested with a uh, regular pre-printed ballot, which we call test deck on, on our machine. So the equipment that we'll be using are the DS-200 scanner and vote tabulator, express vote barking device. Also, we will be testing ballot code scanner, keypad, and headphones. And I'll go with all those later on. This next page is is a description of our uh, voting equipment. And let's say the express vote ballot marking device, I always say this is like a, a very expensive pin because it's not all it is a marking device, but it's very key to using it for election because it eliminates unfair marks and it also provides a paper paper vote record on completion of each elect, uh, each vote. The DS200 scanner is just a tabulation, tabulation, and a tabulation of the, of the results. The voting equipment configuration, the voting equipment configuration test during the LNA process is the same configuration as used for early voting and election day. Okay. Pre predetermined script. Each each unit each unit voting equipment is tested by recording the test votes from the predetermined script. I look at these set, these scripts are just uh, where by set use this script as it's just a pattern for voting. Um, so it's just it's just and then so by express votes you have to do a man you have to manually vote each ballot to create a test set. So they have to create we have to use these scripts so, so every time we do uh, a test, we, they're, they're, all the results become the same. And so let's say if we're on a, on a, a polling site, it has 30 machines, a, a technician will have to test all 30 machines using the same script. And each, well, each technician is going to use the same script. I'm sorry. The script is created by the DCBOE staff and provided to all technicians. Uh, if, a, if a machine of any of the equipment fails in the testing process, it is removed and replaced by another machine, and it will, re, it will be reviewed at the end of the election. Testing express votes. Each te technician is given predetermined script, a checklist, and security codes for the express vote and for the DS-200s. During this checklist, the checklist uh, requires the technicians to do check different uh, settings, such as AC power, the battery power, 
uh, native software, and the date and time and time zone. Uh, checking the time and date is really crucial because, um, such as in our instance, in the general election, which is in November, uh, we normally complete the LNA contest on the test prior to uh, daylight savings time. So we have to make sure that our, our uh, machine units will be able to switch over on, to the right time during while you're simply waiting to do on, the, on election day in November. Technicians then use the election qualification code, also known as EQC. The EQC removes the previous previous election and adds a new election code to the, each voting unit. And this also safeguards from any form ballot being submitted to the voting unit. It also uh, safeguards from uh, foreign media being submitted to the unit as well. After EQC is being used, each technician uploads the election definition USB with the new election on it. has all the new ballots. After the election definition has been loaded, and the next, then this is where the technicians will go in and go do the predetermined script that will be executed, and they'll go in and feed feed as many ballots and as uh, feed the ballot and, and do test every single candidate until all the candidates are, are has been selected and all um, all questions have been answered on the ballot. So at, at the end of the at the end of the testing, there will be several ballots that will be cast. So they use that those several those ballots test that for the DS two hundred element process. It says that the stack of sample ballots that are marked uh, and scanned during testing. Also during the LMA process, I have the, te the technicians have to test the comp other components of the, on the express boat, such as the ADA headphones and keypad. The, the technicians will have to vote cut two ballots with using the headphones and make sure every single key on the uh, keypad works properly. So they have to check the tempo, the volume, and you should go back and forth and also be able to select uh, each race. After the after the, the LNA for the express law has been completed, they have to go through the following. They have to shut the machine will be powered down, security compartments are locked, timber seals are applied to all doors, seal numbers are then recorded on the checklist. The checklist will then, will then be signed and dated by the technician that accepted them that unit. Express will then move to one central area on the Once the once the express votes have been completed, the DS two hundred will now be tested. The DS two hundred checklist is similar to the, the express vote checklist, which has we also check an AC power, physical damage. Time, date, battery status, firmware, things of that matter. But two things are key that are different are you check to make sure the ballot box, box inside of the unit is empty, and there's also a backup memory stick that, that goes into the DS200. Uh, then, as, after everything's been checked, the, the technician will load, again load the EQC to remove all previous elections and add the new election code. And again, this is to safeguard any form ballot and material to the new unit. Once the EQC is been uploaded, then we'll do the same as the express vote, the election definition. After confirming the settings of the DS200, we open the code. By opening the code, we the zero report is printed. The zero report is there to show that there was no no cash ballot on the on the machine when the time of us opening opening the code. After the zero report is tested, I mean, it is printed on the screen, there's also a public count where it shows zero. We met, match those up as well to make sure that zero point in the public count says zero. Public count is just the total amount of ballots that they were the machine for that, for the current election. This is also, uh, um, after, uh, after, after, I'm sorry, after the public count is checked, we run the express vote test deck, the, the regular paper take paper test deck into the machine. 
um, depending on the location, depending on the location, again, like I said earlier, depends, it will, depends on, I'm sorry, depending on the location, it depends on how many ballots there will be ranked in each uh, Like I said, in November, in the general election, there are several ballots that are ranked through the ballot to the machine. Also, we also check by party and, and races to where it makes make, make more ballots. The test is considered over completed when all the test decks have been lined through the, the, the DS200. Once, once the unit has, once the ballot is all have been tested, we close polls. We, we close the polls on every all every single DS200. And after the polls are closed, the, the results are printed from the automatically the results are printed from the machine and begin modem process button pops up. Again, prior to hitting the begin modem process, I'd like to tell you what it means. The purpose of the modem process is to upload the results to uh, from each DS200 to headquarters to be a, a certified private network. And so I have all the technicians will have all the screens up and begin modem process and we'll send all the ballots all at one time to check to test our system as well to make sure we can receive all 200 or 300 machines that we have available in ballot all at the same time. Normally during a normal election, it would not, they would not do that. It wouldn't go, all the ballots wouldn't come at one time, but we just test our system out just to make sure that it is able to handle that workload. Once the machine, once, all the, once the BOE, BOE staff verify that they received the DS200 upload, and the results are approved, uh, zero, we, we reset all the DS200 to zero. And, and so we can send finalize the machine. And so we print out a zero report to confirm that this machine, each machine is set back, we set back to zero. Some of the final steps that we have to do is remove all test decks from each unit and then uh, add all security, uh, block all security compartments, add tamper proof seal, again, write down, write down the serial numbers on ch our checklist, add this, our technicians by the checklist by date, and just verify that the that checklist, everything's correct. Mm -hmm. Station of DS200 in a certain essential area where they're under surveillance. Following the completion of the testing, all documentation is collected and stored in a secure room and is restricted access. In summary, I just want to emphasize logical accuracy, accuracy testing is very serious and it's just one mechanism that we have to ensure the integrity of the election, each election. In general, testing includes conducting physical inspections of all equipment, Using memory tips and qualification codes and lesson codes. And I want to emphasize that we have to use the qualification codes so that there's no foreign uh, media or ballots being presented into our machine during our election process. So if, if, if one, just say someone did put a, a ballot from previous election into the machine, but all of that kick out and reject it. Utilizing predetermined scripts. That's crucial because with that, the machine lets us know if the machine is able to tabulate the machine, machines correctly. Testing of DS200 and express load units, uploading test, uploading test results via the certified network, private network, securing, preparing the equipment delivery. Yes, once again, um, as our voting unit has been, before we send everything out, all the equipment out, we have temporary proof seals on. If any seal is ripped or broken for any for any reason, we will remove that seal and that machine is replaced and we hold it for after the election for review. Storing our equipment under 24-7 surveillance cameras. Finally, the equipment is under, under surveillance 24 hours, even at our warehouse. Um, and now, not only just our warehouse, but even at our polling location. Uh, even at a polling location, we actually have higher uh, security guards. 
that not all polling cases were a lot of our polling numbers. To conclude, just to conclude my presentation, thank you for having me here this, uh, this afternoon. If you have any questions or would like to know any more about the process, please contact me at djones at d2boe or 202-834-6334. Thank you, Duan. I'm going to pass the ball now to Shelly. Um, thank you very much. I am Shelly Jackson, the Deputy Director of Elections in Utah. I have been with the State Lieutenant Governor's Office since the beginning of the year, but before that, I worked at the county level, and I have, I think, done every job in elections from working a polling place to delivering equipment, um, the LNA that was just described, programming the ballot, and overseeing the by mail process. So today I'm here to talk a little bit about ballot security and our process in Utah. Um, I want to begin telling you a little bit about Utah and the things that are done all year to ensure the security of our ballots uh, long before we ever mail them out. First, Utah is a mostly by mail state. Um, we do require polling places. So all active registered voters are mailed a ballot and we do require a vote center if the county is running the election. Uh, in odd years, such as 2021, some of the municipalities have the option of running their own elections. And so their laws are a little bit different, but um, the standard is that we would have at least one vote center in every county. Um, and the municipalities are still required though to mail a ballot. So every election you can count on every active voter uh, receiving a ballot. Uh, Wisconsin defined their, they just had one class of voter that's active. We have active and inactive. So an inactive voter is still on the poll, um, the polling place rules. They could still come in and vote. We just don't mail them a ballot. And that's normally because We've gotten a piece of returned mail from them, and we're not sure that we have the right address. As you know, elections are run all year and not just on election day. So we're doing a lot of things around uh, all year round. Working to keep our voter list clean. We had some good discussions about that. We're doing just about all of those, ERIC, vital records, NCOA, et cetera. Um, our law does prevent ballots from being forwarded by the USPS, and so therefore, if a voter moves or doesn't live at that address that we have on file for them, it will be returned to our county office. And of course, we're doing duplicate checks um, all the time. If a voter does not register using their Utah driver's license number, or if we can't verify that number with our driver's license division, then we mark them in our system as needs ID. And that means that when they get their ballot, they are prompted to return their ballot with some form of identification. Uh, we've got a list of those on our website, but basically we want to prove their identity and their residence with their ballot. Uh, this applies to all voters voting by mail for the first time. Um, but once we've been able to do an ID verification on them, they don't need to do that if they continue in, in time of voting by mail. A voter is also classified as a first time by mail voter if they're removed from the rolls for whatever reason, and then they go and re-register. So um, that gets a little bit confusing sometimes with voters. Our current uh, election management system keeps up to five voter signatures on file for each voter. And we're hoping that our new system that rolls out will keep even more. Each county office has procedures for handling those ballots that are returned as undeliverable. And this helps us to keep our records updated and to inactivate voters that we can't verify their address. Probably the most important part of a successful vote by mail process is a process to allow a voter to cure any problems with their ballot. Um, and for things like their signature doesn't match, uh, they didn't sign their ballot envelope, things like that. Um, if possible, I want to play this video, and if not, it's on our website. The Clerks Association put this video together, and it's a very nice overview of uh, 
Election officials work hard to maintain the integrity, security, and privacy of elections in Utah. Vote by mail is becoming increasingly popular in Utah. But have you ever wondered what happens to your ballot once you send it in? Returned ballots are sent to the election box. Each ballot envelope has a unique mark that gives you credit for voting. This ensures that each voter can vote. Audio is not coming through so much anymore. Sorry, you don't have the audio? Yeah. Okay, we can just move on. It's available on vote.utah.gov under the Secure Your Mail Ballot. And it, it's gonna, it just visualizes all the steps that we're going to show. So if you want to learn more. Oh, okay. Sorry, there you go. Um, also on that tab is this flow chart. Um, hopefully the video just seeing it gives you a little idea of what we find it very helpful to um, direct our voters to that and show it to them. The county clerks also use it when they're giving tours of their ballot centers. So I'm going to break down each of these steps. <clears throat> First, returned ballot. So when the ballot comes back to the county clerk, um, each ballot return envelope has a voter ID embedded into the barcode, as well as a unique absentee ballot ID number. Originally, we only had the voter ID number on the envelopes, but it became problematic when ballots were spoiled and we were sending subsequent ballots out to the voters. We decided we needed an easier way to identify which ballot was spoiled and which ballot we would be accepting back into the clerk's office. Most of our counties use a privacy tab to cover the voter signature from being uh, readable when it's in the mail system, although not all counties utilize this and it's not in code. After the ballots are scanned in and the voter's ballot is recorded as received, it's time to move on to verifying the signatures. Whether this is done by a machine or it's done manually, each ballot signature is reviewed on each ballot. Signatures with no issues uh, are able to advance onto the next step and be tabulated. Signatures that fail the first review are put in a queue for a second and a possible third review. It's standard on the third review that it's done by a full-time election staff member. Our current system um, stores up to the five different signatures. I think I mentioned that before. And these signatures come from registration forms, other affidavits that the voter might sign, um, and the registration forms, it can be the electronic ones from driver's license or the paper forms. For signatures that pass review in either stage of the signature verification, the ballot is removed from the envelope and the ballot becomes anonymous. All of those ballots are updated and the status of counted so that the voter can track that and make sure their ballot is counted. When signatures cannot be verified or the envelope is unsigned, Utah has codified different procedures for notifying the voter in what we call the cure process. The cure process is very important in conducting by mail elections. Um, we answered a lot of calls last year in 2020 from voters who were hearing nationwide. You're just gonna throw out my ballot. If, it, if my signature doesn't match, please tell me you know, with what name I signed it, how I signed it. Um, and it's nice to be able to reassure those voters, no, we have a process for reaching out to you. Utah does not require a witness signature, just an affidavit signed by the voter. And counties uh, have different statutory duties depending on how they're doing the notifications. So if they are emailing or texting the voter, they have one day after the ballot is rejected. And if they're sending a letter or phoning the voter, they have two days. The county has discretion to verify the voter's identity over the phone and allow that ballot, ballot to be counted. If a letter or an email is sent, the voter must complete an affidavit and return it to the county. Affidavits are allowed to be returned until 5 p.m. the day before the canvas, and then we can include that ballot in the ticket. Um, in Utah, it's the first ballot that's returned by a voter that is counted. And this allows us to have early voting and election day vote centers and continue processing those by mail ballots. We do not require a by mail ballot to be surrendered to vote in person. 
Um, voters are checked in. Most counties use the no link e poll pad or some other electronic poll pad. Uh, and they can issue that ballot at the polling place. If the voter's record shows that their by mail ballot has been returned, the voter may choose to vote a provisional ballot. And then during the canvas, it can be determined, obviously, if the voter did, in fact, uh, return the by mail ballot. And that's also provisional ballots are also how we do same day registration in Utah. Um, we can move on to the next presenter or I can take questions now, but thank you for inviting me. Shelly, um, we will pass it to Neil Kelly. Yep. You hear me now? Yes. Awesome. And you should have uh, the you should have the power too to share your screen. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I'm gonna upset that energy, Amy. So can you run my slides for me? <laughs> yes. Uh, give me one second. Introduce yourself, and I will point your slides up. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Neil Kelly, Registrar of Voters for Orange County, California. Even though I can't see you all, it's great to be among you in your presence. Um, I, I wish we were together uh, to be able to do this. And I'm thanking Amy in advance for this because I've had a few technical challenges, but she's been very patient. Awesome. Okay, your slides are up. <laughs> Terrific. So we go to the next slide, if you if you could please. So what I want to talk about uh, with you all is how can we possibly bake integrity into our election operations? And when I say baking integrity, I'm not talking about the actual piece of integrity that we all have. I'm talking about how does the public perceive us and what can we provide to the public um, amidst all of these attacks that we're facing uh, for, for additional reassurances. Next slide. So some of the challenges, and, and this is not lost on all of you, we're all sharing this together. Um, the disinformation spread is gonna continue. We, I, I fully anticipate through 22, 24 and beyond. Um, but, but there's things I think that we can do to continue to push back on this narrative. And, and one of the things that I wanted to do was to find a way to have a third party audit. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about Arizona and how that's been compared to what we did, but, um, it, to be able to provide some something to point to so that individuals or organizations that are questioning uh, what we're doing or the elections themselves can actually look at this data and, and see what's been done. And I think one of the things that I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, is that as more and more individuals, you know, they read everything on the internet and they believe it, and then they come to our offices and have no concept or clue that we actually conduct a tremendous amount of audits uh, on our elections. And so I've, I've seen this shift away from people kind of saying you should do ballot audits and focusing on voter registration. Why aren't you looking at voter registration? Because they realize that we're already doing these audits on our ballots. Next slide. And so looking at my role, what, I mean, one of the things I really wanted to do carefully was to say, can we quantify the integrity of the elections? Is there a way to do that through analysis? And I'm gonna take you back to a quick story from 2018. Um, in Orange County here, we had five of our congressional districts that flipped from red to blue. That was worldwide news <laughs> because, you know, the old um, stereotype of Orange County being very Republican, and then suddenly we had these congressional districts flip that was a, a huge sea change. And there was a tremendous amount of backlash to that. And I dealt with a lot of issues out of that election. And that's when I really said, okay, I'm, I'm done with that. We've got to figure out a way to provide additional um, reassurances to the public. And so I looked to partner with Caltech. And Caltech um, being a, obviously a third party independent organization, uh, but academic as well. And I, and I just very briefly want to, to say that there have been some debates, I was on some recent panels that we talked about the value of academics partnering with election officials. And some members in the academic community were saying, well, that's kind of a challenge because sometimes election officials don't have the bandwidth or the time to have this meaningful partnership. And I would argue against that. I actually kind of reject that argument and say that there's so much value that can come out of that um, through this process that it's worth um, going down that path. Um, next slide. And we can bounce right back that, Amy, or pass that, Amy, sorry. Um, so what we did is uh, started a partnership with Caltech where they came in with a very large team of graduate students as well as um, members of the academic team 
to conduct a forensic audit on our operations. And I just recently kind of pulled that forensic verbiage out of the actual audit papers because, again, going back to Arizona and this discussion about forensic audits should be conducted, um, but in California, you can't use third parties to conduct forensic audits, audits of ballots, but there was nothing to say we couldn't do that or voter registration systems. And, and of course, the election data itself. And so they set about to start examining the 2018 elections. And then we, we morphed into the 2020 cycle um, with them and continued in that partnership. And they built a set of tools to evaluate the integrity of our elections. So we had these um, tools that were really useful to monitor the systems that we were using, as well as providing metrics based off of, of that monitoring. And I'll get into the what we did specifically here in a second, but next slide. So talked about the audit of the voter registration database, and that was something that was very significant. What we did is set up a tool for them to be able to pull data from us on a daily basis, um, and they grabbed that data and provided analysis on it uh, every 24 hours. And that was a huge, of course, they set up scripts and algorithms to do that in advance. But one of the things that I told them, because they said, what is it you want us to look at? And one of the things I wanted to focus on was anomalies between party changes, because there was all of this noise after the 2018 elections about, you know, fraudulent change of, of party from Republican to Dem and et, et cetera, and all the things you all have heard as well. Uh, and so we were looking at things like that. That's one example of several data points we were looking at, is what's the rate of change we, we would expect to see for party changes and were there anomalies within that? And then of course, analyzing other things that you can see here on screen, like precinct turnout data, which is really important, um, which I'll touch on here in just a second. Next slide. So just drilling down into that uh, audit of the voter database a little bit further, um, they were able to detect uh, a, a quite a few number of duplicates that the state voter database wasn't picking up on. And they created a different algorithm to allow us to identify these high confidence matches on potential duplicates and drill down a little bit further into that. And we've continued that partnership all the way through today. We're still doing that with Caltech. And that is in addition to what we're doing with the statewide voter database. So it's been a real uh, help for us in identifying additional duplicates. And one of the things that we did before I um, locked the ballot file for a recall election that we're handling right now is to go in and do extra dupe checks on that gap. The time that you lock the ballot file and then you have all of that churning of data before you actually mail out ballots, that's always been a challenge. And you send out sometimes three or four ballots to individuals because these dupes aren't detected. Um, that's really helped, helped us to almost eliminate that issue completely with this election. Next slide. Um, I think the main thing I want to point out there is that second bullet, and that is that in Caltech's final reports, and they issued a series of reports on this um, forensic audit, they did not detect any unusual or anomalous events uh, during the time that they were evaluating our database. And that was significant. If you look in those detailed reports, there are dozens and dozens of data points that they were looking at and found no issues um, related to, to the processing of that data or the data itself. Next slide. Um, just very quickly, some of the other things that they did is they monitored our social media channels um, in detail, and they would analyze that and look for trends that would be developing out of that. They found that the volume of discussion of our elections during 2020 was lower than it was for California or the nation as a whole. And when I talk about the discussion, I'm not talking about issues or things that people might post, but negative issues that would be cropping up. And, and if we did have negative issues that cropped up, they were on it and they would look into it and determine what the cause was. Next slide. In-person observations, they had full teams out uh, during our whole vote, vote center cycle, uh, 11 days of voting, and provided very detailed reports on that. You can see that in the final outcome, but again, um, noting that they didn't detect any issues uh, of a fraudulent nature or things that need to be investigated further, and it was really helpful to have that, that kind of third set of eyes out there. Next slide. Okay, this is one of the, the two next slides I think are one of the most critical. We had a lot of uh, 
pushback on the shared districts that we had for the congressional district with LA County and our county. And there was a lot of, you know, finger pointing about saying, well, there was, you know, unusual amounts of Dem voting or people that were Republicans that we believe were voting the, the Dem and doing split ticket voting. And so I asked Caltech to really focus on those precincts in, in our shared counties. And, you know, they found, and this would be the normal distribution you would expect to see of split ticket voting uh, between people that might be, you know, one party or the other and, and, and voting another party on the ticket. And when you look at the actual data from between LA County and Orange County, this is what we saw on the next slide. This normal distribution is exactly what we should have seen. And this report really details and drills down into that. And when I started providing this information and data to all the organizations that were pushing back on me because our congressional districts turned blue, it really quieted the noise. And I can't tell you how much I love that link to be able to send out so many times when things come up that I can point to this Caltech audit and this Caltech report. And it just really quiets people down in, in many respects. Next slide. Uh, we talked about that, so we can go past that, Amy, sorry. We did poll worker surveys, um, and this helped us because it uh, allowed this third party look at it and not just our county producing this information, but an actual third party analysis and found that we had nearly 90% confidence levels on our poll worker side. And then on the voters themselves, there's information in those reports about their confidence levels on the elections in Orange County. We were tracking about eight points higher than what they were seeing on the national average. Um, and I, I think all the work that we did leading into the 2020 cycle really helped to stabilize some of that. Um, and, and Caltech was able to report that out. And I think we're almost on the final slide here. So uh, the, the last thing I wanna leave you with is just this is a really good way, in my opinion, this, this partnership that I've had with Caltech has taken a lot of bandwidth from the office and what we've done, but to be able to showcase these reports and to point to them and to have this ongoing analysis of our voter database that is outside of what the state is doing or outside of what we're doing even has been tremendously helpful. And it again, helps to bake in integrity into our operations. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Neil. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so obviously all of you do all of these things in different ways, which was part of why um, I wanted, uh, I sort of asked each of you to focus on, on particular topics. But one of the questions um, that I got is, um, have you, and I use this broadly for all three panelists, seen an increase in interest in observation of logic and accuracy testing uh, in the last, you know, in 2020? Um, and uh, do you have limits on the number of observers you have at, at logic and accuracy testing? Duana, I'm gonna go to you first because it came in while you were talking. You are muted. We have not seen an uptick in uh, people coming in to see us. We had the same number of uh, uh, people from the public come in. It's only, only like three or four people actually came to watch it. Um, the past few elections, was actually made about three or four each time. But other than, so I'm, I'm assuming it may go up in the next election cycle. I'm not sure. Not in DC anyway. I think I was one of those three or four. Uh, Shall we or Neil? <laughs> we saw um, definitely more interest. Um, we used to beg when I was at the county level, beg the city recorders to come in, the candidates. No one cared. And um, the county that I just most recently worked at reported um, a dozen or more people, a couple city recorders, a couple of candidates and some citizens. And I'll just add, Amy, uh, we had about eight to 10 uh, for the general election in 2020 come in and observe, and that usually is around one or two, if that. But as a comparison, we had 200 come in for signature review. So um, big difference between those two. And the last thing I'll say is that in our statewide recall election, we just started LNA yesterday and I had three people show up. <laughs> 
Um, and you one, know, one of the questions. Oh, go ahead, Monica. I'm sorry, just one thing I'd like to add. We consistently invite people to come and we have extended a lot of personal invitations and unfortunately people prefer not to come and reserve and observe the process, but they like to be armchair quarterbacks and comment on something they have not actually reviewed. One other thing I'll add is we're actually having more success getting getting legislators to come in and tour our ballot operations. And again, before we used to invite them, beg them, and now they're um, this year taking us up on that. Thank you. Um, Neil, one question we got for you is, um, is the Caltech tool proprietary to Caltech or is it commercial off the shelf or some combination? It is proprietary to Caltech. They developed it uh, and they did, I think, an awesome job doing that. They have a couple of really smart and talented graduate students that really worked on that system and, and continue to um, operate that. Now, I will say this, that because of what we did in 2018 and moving to 20, uh, LA County has started uh, to do some work with Caltech and the state of Oregon had started um, before Steve had left to start to do some work with Caltech. So they're not opposed to doing it in other jurisdictions, I guess that's an important point. It is, thank you. Do you find that when you send those reports to some of the, the more skeptical people that they that they accept it because it's Caltech? Yes, I mean, I, I love to, I'm smiling, Amy, because I love sending out that link. Um, I have used that more often in the last year and a half than anything else. Uh, there's a couple though, you know, they push back on academics, et cetera, et cetera, but by and large, there's wide adoption to what Caltech did. And Caltech comes with such a, a tremendous amount of credibility um, that that really helps as well. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Um, NASA members, you're welcome to unmute and ask. Amy, it's Michelle. Um, so I have a, a question for, for Neil. Um, I appreciate that you did a uh, survey in 2018. Have you done one about 2020? I think that, you know, for us, we're just seeing such a dramatic change in perspective of, you know, are we confident, are we not confident? And, you know, 2018, everyone was pretty confident. I'm um, just wondering if you've had any, um, any new reports that you're going to do or any, any data about confidence levels from the 2020 election. Hi, Michelle, it's good to see you, by the way. And I, I will say that, you know, coming off of 2018, um, there were, lower confidence levels, I think, than maybe we saw across the nation just because of our flip in those congressional districts. And so that's one of the reasons that we did that survey and I was a little surprised at the outcome. Um, I will say that um, we have done surveys out of 2020 and you're right, those confidence levels dropped um, from what we saw in 2018. Uh, I don't have the data right in front of me to share it with you, but we do have it on our website. So obviously pushing back and working on that, we'll continue to um, survey our voters in 22. Other questions? I can keep going. Yeah, um, keep going. So I know we were talking about like the LNA testing and you know, Neil, you had a lot of people that came for the signature verification piece do you have the ability to limit observers at any stage in the process? Um, and do you, uh, does anyone see any, um, have you had to like employ extra security for these processes? Um, I know that there are lots of places out there where I've seen like they will live stream things and stuff like that. Um, but have any of you, any of the panelists seen like, you know, do you have the ability under law to limit them and have you, do you think you'll need to use that in the security? Is there additional security that you're worried that you might need to, to have? Again, 2020 was a little bonkers. So, you know, if we're having this conversation in 2018, I, I wouldn't be asking this, so. Yeah, Amy, can I jump in real quick? Um, 
So, Michelle, on that one, uh, in 2020, we set up a very robust remote observation platform and limited the in-person observation here in the building. And we limited that based on um, the size of the area where we put all of our operators and came up with a number and the law backed us up in California to be able to limit that. I was threatened a couple of times with litigation, but it never transpired. And because of what we did um, with the remote observation platform, that allowed people from home to log in and actually watch the signature review process. And that shocks, I think, a lot of people when I tell them that because you think about the privacy and, and the security, but we put them through a very legal, a very extensive legal um, uh, acknowledgement and then uh, uh, provided the signature access. And so they were able to do that. The thing they couldn't do remotely was challenge. That's the main thing that they could only do in person. For this election, for the recall, because we have this statewide election, I'm not limiting the capacity now because we have rolled back some of that in the state, um, but we still are off offering the remote observation tool. And in DC, we didn't really find it necessary to limit the number of people who wanted to observe, observe the LNA testing and signature verification process because we just didn't have the numbers there. But when we um, did conduct our audits and our um, post-election audit was done in our headquarters and not at our warehouse location, we were much more limited to space. And so that was streamed. And so observers were able to view that process um, virtually instead of doing that in person. In Utah, anecdotally, I've talked to clerks who have said that they're now thinking of putting in windows and places for observers to be so that they won't be in the ballot warehouse. And that's sort of behind the times from other states, but I think you know we've recognized that that's becoming an issue. And Neil, I just put um, monitoringtheelection.us in the chat, um, but for those watching at home, uh, monitoringtheelection.us is the um, link to the Orange County work with Caltech. Thanks, Amy. I just got a couple of requests for that, so thank you. Amy. Also, I like. I was just reminded we did add a little bit more security during our LNA process, but that was also because we had ballots being returned. Um, after, well, it was right after the LNA process. We also had ballots being returned from the, from the mail drop boxes and stuff like that. So all that was being done at our warehouse. So we, had, we did add a little bit more security than normal because of the pandemic. Any other questions? We have time for maybe one more. Okay, then back to you, Michelle, to close us out. Thanks, Amy. Uh, thank you to our panelists. I think this was a, it, yeah, a, a well-timed topic for us to, to have some information about and, of course, information sharing about what works and what ways to improve our election process is something we all enjoy, as well as watching Amy's cat. Um, and um, so Amy has already sent the link for the next session, and the next session will be a state legislative break. Um, uh, update, I'm sorry, state legislative update. And I think that doesn't start till 345. So are we running? No, that, that should be, are we? Amy, I have the run of show. Oh, you're right. You're right. We are a little bit early. <laughs> so we could take more so, yeah. questions if anyone has them. Otherwise, we can break until 345 Eastern time because that's where I am. All right, so otherwise, we, we will see everybody at 345 for a legislative update. Thank you to our panelists. We really appreciated that information. Thank you.